Namaskar and a very warm welcome to everyone who's viewing this. I would like to thank the India International Center New Delhi for inviting me to speak about and explore our city's heritage through a virtual presentation. My name is Anisha Shekhar Mukherjee and I am an architect with a specialization in conservation. I live and work in Delhi, a city which has been termed the Rome of Asia. It would of course be equally apt to call Rome the Delhi of Europe. And both these cities have had a long and tumultuous history, which has left its visible mark in the form of many tangible remnants of the past. And in Delhi, you may encounter these at practically every turn of the road. I intend to speak about some of these remnants today, which still define the very image of our city. And I plan to do this in the form of a walking dialogue in which I hope it is not just my voice, but the very built spaces themselves that will speak to you. So let's begin our journey through space and time with some images. These are not from different parts of Delhi, but they are from the same built complex. And these images record parts of a place that has been called the Kila e Mubarak, the exalted citadel, the most magnificent palace in the East, known more prosaically and directly today as the Red Fort or the Lal Kila. The Red Fort was used and experienced by a large number of people. Visitors entered it through its grand entrance streets and large formal forecourts, decorated with fountains and awnings, but were rarely allowed further into the innermost parts of the fort. The attendants who lived and worked in the fort also entered through the same gateways, but were generally directed to other parts of the fort and very rarely entered its more formal ceremonial parts. And the emperor himself, who is lord of the entire fort, is indeed of the entire realm, stayed in parts of the fort that had their own private forecourts and gardens, and again, rarely ventured into other parts of the fort. So everyone who used the fort or visited it or experienced it did so in different ways. And therefore, everybody saw the fort and imagined it in different ways. As in this rendition, which is by an artist from Lucknow, drawn sometime in the late 18th century, in which the arrangements of the fort have been simplified and shown to be far less complex than they actually were. So therefore, most depictions of the fort that we have today are either partial or they are imagined representations. And there is no one image of the fort that existed in the minds of its users and which has come down to us. And there were many parts of the fort and some of its domains were in a sense invisible to, to many people. It had many, many layers. Today, however, there is one overwhelming image of the fort that populates our minds and this is something that most of us will instantly recognize, including four-year-old children across the country who just entered formal school. It's an image of the Red Fort's outer walls. It's Lahori Gate, to be precise, atop which the Indian flag waves proudly. 
And every 15th August, it is this view of the court that we salute, that is routinely printed on the front pages of our newspapers every Independence Day. And this is what also pops up on our computer screens. So the Red Fort is an icon of not just Delhi, but also of India. It is also used to advertise ventures ranging from restaurants in Prague and London to even products like basmati rice. So for many of us, this is all there is to the Red Fort and we literally and figuratively stop short at its Lahori gate, rarely bothering to proceed within or to wonder about its long and checkered historical existence. For instance, how many of us even realize that this familiar view from where the Prime Minister addresses the nation each Independence Day is actually the antithesis of the fort's original design. So ironically, the single-pointed focus on the Red Fort, icon of independent India, and freedom against British rule, has actually directed attention away from its unique design. A design which has inspired various times and at varying levels, all manner of art and architecture within and beyond the Mughal Empire, ranging from Sikh religious buildings to Rajput palaces, to mansions of noblemen, to houses of, of, of ordinary people. Now the original entrance to the Red Fort uh, through its Lahori gate was straight and open to view. It was not barred by any walls or mounds in front of it, in keeping with the actual and metaphorical accessibility of Shah Jahan, under whom and in whose reign it was constructed. And this wall that we see today in front of the Lahori Gate of the Fort, as well as other main gate, the Delhi Gate, was actually made on the orders of Aurangzeb Shah Jahan's son after he defeated his brothers in the war of succession for the Mughal throne and imprisoned his ailing father at the Agra fort. And this in fact reverses the very notion of the fort's original function and appearance. And Shah Jahan is then reported to have written a letter to him in which he said, dear son, you have made the fort a bride and put a veil upon her face. All or almost all representations of the fort since then have been defined by this veil in front of its main public gateways, including for instance, this drawing from the artist David Gentleman's book called David Gentleman's India. And this is the manner in which is chosen to represent the Red Fort. It's a very familiar view with this wall blanking out its interior. This forbidding veil in front of the public gateways of the fort was made even more opaque by the British during their takeover of the fort. And this happened in 1857. I would like to draw aside this veil which has obscured not just the physical form of the Red Fort's interior, but also changed its relationship with its surroundings. And I'd like to take you within the huge fort today to revisit the spaces in it. And I hope you'll be able to get some idea of what it contained originally, what it symbolized in the Mughal way of life, why the pioneering British historian, James Ferguson, termed it the most magnificent and what is its relevance today, guarded and conserved. This understanding of the fort that I'm going to present has been pieced together after sifting through various depictions of its existence available today, of its historical existences available today, 
including um, the Mughal dynasty's official um, court chronicles in which the court routine has been recorded, miniature paintings um, from that time and later, drawings, photographs, travelogues, diaries of individuals associated with the fort. And most importantly, after studying the original Mughal structures that presently exist in the fort. So this quest has taken me obviously inside the fort many, many times in all seasons. But not just that, it's also taken me to museums and collections that house any information on the fort, whatever information I could find on the fort, uh, as well as on Mughal society and contemporary architecture of that kind and to other Mughal courts to see if I could dig out any clues from their forms and um, functions to piece together a picture of what the fort originally looked like. So it's been a bit like a process of detection where I've not just tried to access clues, but also I had to analyze and interpret these to figure out which were red herrings and which actually were indicative of what it may have been like when it was originally uh, built and used. And a lot of that information is, of course, already in the public domain in the form of a book titled The Red Court of Shah Jahanabad, which I had written uh, many, many years ago. And some part of its um, designed attributes are what I hope we will discover today as we go into the fort. Now, as part of the research, I found this very interesting map, which is now in the Oriental and India Office collections, British Library. And this dates from the late 18th century. What the artist has chosen to do here is to just record the outer walls of the Red Fort. And um, these have also been simplified into uh, square which is not really the, the shape of the fort at all. And if there is, he's chosen, he or she has chosen to represent a blank open space inside. So this is very interesting because it seems to mirror the, the present perception of the fort where most of us just stop short at the outer walls. Not just that, it also seems to eerily foretell what the fort's interior is like today, because today the fort's interior resembles the empty space that's depicted in this map to an astonishing degree. Now, we of course don't know why the artist chose to represent the fort in this manner, because um, actually the density and variety of the fort's uh, spaces inside can be seen from this map, which is one of its most detailed representations. And uh, though it is again, not strictly accurate in terms of the exact proportions of either the fort's boundary or the spaces in it, nonetheless, it's, it's one of the most complete forms of um, the fort, which shows most of its spaces in a more or less um, accurate depiction. Now, as I mentioned, very few of these structures of the fort actually exist in it today. And this is a redrawn version of the same map in which um, I have outlined the existing Mughal structures uh, in, in black. And you can see that it's essentially just the outer circuit of the fort, it's red walls, and a few, very few scattered structures inside that remain. Um, the rest of the structures and gardens inside, which I've not highlighted, are actually not there anymore. They do not exist. And um, how did this happen and when did this happen? So this radical transformation of the fort occurred um, shortly after 1857. And uh, you know, at a time when our great grandfathers or our great great grandfathers were alive, so this was when the British took over the fort after they defeated the last Mughal ruler, Bahadur Shah Zafar. 
And though the fort had, through its, its life, been subject to attacks and pillage, uh, never had it been desecrated and um, looted to the extent that it was after 1857. So in 1860, a little more than two years after they took over the fort, the British passed in order to demolish not only all structures uh, within uh, a distance of 500 meters around the fort, but also more than 80% of the structures within the fort. And in their stead, barracks for the British army were put up. And the transformation that this caused can be seen when we, when we compare two, two plans of the fort. One is just before 1857 and one just after 1857. And in the plan above I have, which is the, the plan that shows the fort before it was demolished, I have shaded in the built structures in black and uh, same thing for uh, the structures that existed and that were built after 1857. And you may see not just the difference in the density of the built structures, but also the manner in which they have been located and positioned and how that affects your sense of open space as well. A photograph of the area from the top of Jama Masjid shortly after the demolition also shows the empty spaces around the fort, making it an island severed of its connecting links to Shah Jahanabad. Within the Red Fort, there were very few mobile structures that escaped demolition, and those that did were looted of their valuable and decorative effects. They were stripped of their gilded copper domes, their precious stones inlaid in their walls, and they were misused and defaced and reused as military prisons, as hospitals, mess lounges, refreshment rooms, and canteens for the British army. Even after first being restored in the early 20th century to present the fort as a showpiece to visiting the British aristocracy and uh, royalty, they continued to be mere shadows of their former selves. And today, when we go inside the fort, we find a few forlorn pavilions set amidst stern barracks and temperamental lawns, tarred roads, and stagnant water. Thus, even the fort's custodians today may find it difficult to relate its title of the Kilai Mubarak or the exalted citadel with the manner in which the fort exists today. And it is only by resolutely ignoring the later intrusions and the decay and examining the original parts of the fort that still exist that one can discern and appreciate their beautiful proportions as in this, which is from the Divani Khas, the whole special audience, and the remnants of their stunning and intricate draftsmanship still seen in the ceilings of the Nakkar Khana Gateway and the Chatha Chok, and in the decoration of the emperor's own living quarters. And the Ainakari, the inset glass and the plaster, remnants of which still remain today. So when we compare these to the views of the fort from the mid 19th century, which um, is, again, we have to remember this is 200 years after the fort was founded. We do not have such views of the fort from the time of Shah Jahan's uh, own sojourn in the fort. But even in these uh, drawings of the fort, which are now in the British Library, we can see the density and variety of its built spaces and also the formality of its entrance sequences. So this is the Chatta Chok, which many of you may have walked under into the Red Fort and beyond that into the Nakkar Khana Fort Fort, 
which was the first principal court court, the court leading on to the, the hall of public audience and further on to the emperor's own living quarters next to the river. In these drawings, the proximity of the port to the river is clearly visible, as is its interface with the city and the multitude of activities and structures in it. Now this, as I mentioned, is about 200 years after the fort was inaugurated. And this is at a time when the Mughal rulers were neither as rich nor as powerful as they were originally. And many parts of the fort had been, um, had been uh, pillaged in some form or the other. So the appearance of the fort in the time of Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb would thus have been many, many times more fascinating than what we can see here. And we have to imagine it. So how was it that the fort's designed form and function continued virtually unchanged over the 200 years from its founding to the time of these pictures? And so even at a time when the formality was diluted and when many parts of the fort were not maintained in the same way in which they would have been when Shah Jahan would have resided in it, nonetheless, they were still impressive enough to be widely admired. So for instance, the British soldiers who plundered it after 1857, many of them recorded their memory of the fort and the right of its uh, gorgeous domes and minarets, of its vast embattled walls, and of its um, castellated palace, which was so huge. Even um, Emily Bailey, who was the daughter of the powerful British resident, Sir Thomas Metcalf, and who saw this in 1848, about um, seven or eight years before, uh, before the port was taken over by the British, she recollects and she writes about what she calls its sublimely beautiful buildings in white marble, in, in the style of the Taj. And these are some drawings uh, which were commissioned by her father, Sir Thomas Metcalf which record some of these buildings and show you the, um, the complexity and beauty of the, these particular buildings. Photographs from this time are also, uh, they, they convey the same sort of information and we can see, we can see for ourselves that the, the fort, even in the 1850s, is still a space which evokes a lot. Now, before speaking of the fort's design, which allowed it to function and appear in this way for hundreds of years after it was founded, it's first important for us to understand the context of the fort's establishment and the circumstances in which it was founded. To begin with, we must realize that the Red Fort is unrivaled anywhere in the world, right from its conception to its construction to its functioning. Why do I say that? First, it's one of the very few or the very rare of uh, an imperial complex built along with its sporting city. It is certainly um, the only such urban Mughal palace complex of its kind. It was designed and built as a holistic venture along with an entire city. And in itself, this is a huge task, as I'm sure we can appreciate even today with all the technological advances we have. It is not a task that is easy to fulfill even today. But apart from the remarkable managerial and construction skills that are manifest in this um, in the fact that the fort and city were made at one time. Uh, what also happened is that because they were planned and conceived united entity, Shah Jahan's builders could take care of all the problems uh, that were encountered in the earlier Mughal courts and cities um, of overcrowding or issues of access or grand enough um, entries. And uh, Shah Jahan's builders could not only work 
on the lessons learned from the earlier movie ports in cities, but could also anticipate the requirements of, um, of, of future times and in a, in a setting that was magnificent enough uh, to befit the most cultured and one of the richest empires in the world at that time. So all the Mughal forts and, uh, that were made prior to the Red Fort were amalgamations of different styles and pieces of construction uh, over the reigns of different rulers. And therefore, there was only that much that could be presented and made in them. And in contrast, the Red Fort was made at one time, so it could actually um, accommodate as well as encompass all the ideas that had been experimented with uh, by the Mughal rulers in the earlier forts and by Shah Jahan too in, in the earlier Mughal forts. So we may say that the Red Fort is the grand finale of Imperial Mughal forts, just as the Taj Mahal, Shah Jahan's um, most famous act of patronage, was the finale to Imperial Mughal tomb gardens. And um, the fort set the trend for domestic as well as ceremonial architecture all over the Mughal Empire and for subsequent uh, and contemporary kingdoms in the subcontinent. And in fact, in its original form, it contained the same level of refinement and detail as the Taj Mahal still does, as we can appreciate when we look at these for you, the Arts of the Red Fort, which perhaps like the Taj, the fort was crafted and built with perfect proportion and detail by an imperial array of craftsmen, masons, and overseers. And when the fort's foundations were marked out on the 29th of April, 1639 CE, during the second decade of Shah Jahan's reign, its design was reportedly led by Ustad. Ahmad and Ustad Hamid Lahori, who some sources claim were also associated with the building of the Taj Mahal. Records show that the best craftsmen and designers decorated the fort with what they call Sikri sandstone, with finest Makrata marble, gold and silver, um, glass from Alipi, a range of semi precious stones from all over the trade centers associated with the Mughal Empire. And the same care that Shah Jahan commanded his trusted aides and artists to expend on the mausoleum of his beloved wife was used to craft his own living areas and those of his family in the fort. So it's often forgotten that the Taj Mahal and the Red Fort were contemporary acts of building. And the Taj was finished barely two years before Shah Jahan grandly celebrated the completion of his magnificent Red Fort in 1648. So both the fort and the Taj were thus created at the peak of Shah Jahan's patronage in a period that is universally recognized as one of the pinnacles of world art and architecture. However, the fort was simultaneously far more complex as well as far more intimate than even the Taj. The Taj Mahal is essentially a mausoleum set within a garden with um, its mosque and ancillary supporting buildings, but the Red Fort is composed of many, many more kinds of buildings. It is not just a tomb or a garden or even a palace in the conventional Western sense of what a palace is as an imperial residence. But in the tradition of the Mughal courts, this was like a city within a city. And it was designed to therefore function as a showpiece of the Mughal Empire, the residence of the Mughal imperial household, an administrative center, recreational space, as well as a cultural focus for Shah Jahanabad. And to put this into context, we can compare it to the Escorial, which um, was made in 1563 in the mountains above Madrid uh, in the reign of um, Philip II. And, and it was, its size made it roughly um, closer to um, the scale of a small city as compared to other Renaissance royal buildings. But even so, it was five times smaller in size than just the inner palace of the Red Fort. Um, this is a conjectural reconstruction of the Red Fort uh, drawn by 
an archaeologist and an architect who was associated with the conservation of the port in the beginning of the 20th century. So there are certain parts of the port which um, are obviously drawn from imagination. Uh, many, uh, many parts of the port were actually uh, uh, uncovered, the foundations were uncovered as part of the conservation exercise and therefore in its overall uh, depiction, it, it's very close to what the red port spaces might have been originally like. So therefore the red port contained, um, as I mentioned, administrative centers, palace pavilions, gardens, houses for the uh, attendants who lived in the fort, quarters for the resident Mughal military, uh, elephant stables, kitchens, um, karkhanas where the craftspeople worked. And we can get a sense of this if we compare it to what our city would normally have for these sort of functions today. So this is akin to it being like the Rashtrapati Bhavan, the North and South blocks, the cantonment, the secretariat, crafts museum, the Supreme Court, etc., etc., all, all in one place, all within the walls of the Red Court. And um, a great number of people came to the fort, therefore, kings, noblemen, petitioners, soldiers, ambassadors, stone setters, weavers, even the poorest of the poor residents. And the fort was actively and almost continuously used as an imperial residence for almost two thirds of its life. Shah Jahan chose to stay here for the remaining part of his reign until he was deposed. And most of his descendants also continued to live here. And all through these years, all these activities that we've spoken about, they worked practically as they were originally designed without intruding on each other and without the huge daily traffic of visitors getting into each other's way. So this was possible because the fort was thoughtfully designed to accommodate a range of public, semi-public, semi-private and private activities. This is, in this plan of the fort, it's easy for you to see this because what I've done is that based on a geometrical and proportionate analysis of the original buildings and spaces in it, Imposed the form of the colonnades that were demolished and the buildings that were demolished onto the fort as it is today. So not only can we see the barracks that stretch across many parts of these original hind courtyards and spaces, but we can also see how these original little courts uh, helped to orient as well as direct people, visitors as well as users within the fort. So the public ceremonial areas were clearly and centrally positioned. They were marked out by straight axes and um, formal courtyards that increased. In so you get got to the emperor's presence. And on the other hand, the private areas, whether those of the emperor on the river face or those of um, the, the, uh, the attendants in the fort, they were shielded from gaze within their own uh, bounding walls and their own forecourts so that they were practically invisible to, to people other than those who needed to go into these areas. Shah Jahan's living palaces and um, his own domains were on the river face. They were not towering vertical complexes in the tradition of most imperial residences, but they were single story pavilions. And they signal their status through the choice of material, through their refinement, and through their detailing. The private entrance to the emperor's chambers was also from the river bank, which was actually celebrated uh, throughout Shah Janabad. So the sighting of functions throughout Shah Janabad was made in deference to the river. And uh, it, the, the fort, imperial pavilions were located to afford stunning views of the river, and um, cool breezes turn, they afforded a grand spectacle from the river where a lot of river traffic was, um, was present in those days. We may see this even in photographs of uh, the place from later on, 
where you can see not just the continuous fabric of the port and along the river, but also the carts which lined the river face further along the city's front. The living and working areas of the craftspeople inside the port, as we saw, were again, they were similar to the city. They were densely built and along twisting streets, but they had a great deal of privacy and despite the proximity to the emperor's presence, they were never threatened by his, um, his uh, presence or um, not, not was their uh, privacy or individuality affected in any way. In fact, um, everybody, as I mentioned, used the port in different ways. And today we can, of course, access most parts of it, but I, I made these areas of movement based on the routine of different people, which I call, I call this the emperor's walk, and this the nobleman's walk, uh, this the queen's walk, and this the an ordinary inhabitant's walk. And what this shows is that different parts of the court were used by different users. So the emperor would enter through the main public gateways, but then essentially go through its formal ceremonial areas and to the to the part of the fort that was furthest from the public gateways and closest to the river. A uh, favored courtier would be able to enter into its um, hall of public audience, and but only a little further into the hall of private audience and would not ever be really allowed into the more private areas of the fort. The Mughal queens were limited to the eastern part of the fort near the river and to the gardens which went uh, closer to the rest of the fort. And the, uh, an ordinary inhabitant of the city could also enter as far as the Vaniyam to the hall of public audience. So the court records show us that every uh, week on a day they could enter into the forecourt and personally petition the emperor for whatever problems they had as well as on special occasions such as festivals. So each sub area within the fort had its own courtyards bounded by gateways and continuous arcades that provided shaded areas to work, sit or walk in and privacy from the other species around them. The open courtyards and gardens also had an advantage of flexibility. If there were more crowds, uh, such as in the fort's inauguration ceremonies or at birthday celebrations of the emperor or festivals, then one could spread canopies and canards and more covered area could be obtained very easily and quickly. So open space was fashioned and designed so that it was used as an extension of build space and build space shaded or enclosed open space so that it could be used effectively in all seasons. And this was true not just for the emperor's own private pavilions, but also for the gateways, for instance, which also doubled up And the private pavilions of the emperor often also doubled up as semi-public uh, celebration spaces, such as the Rang Meher. This is a miniature painting from Muhammad Shah Ramila's time, which shows him celebrating Holi along with uh, his, his family. So the location and orientation of the buildings, gardens, and courtyards that housed all these different activities in the fort well as the size, height, and overall proportions had ecological, functional, and aesthetic reasons. They were practical as well as beautiful. As we can see, the fort's original design um, had a proportion of open spaces, which was far greater than the built spaces. And a large amount of these open spaces were gardens, which were designed to provide pleasant and cool spaces. They are described by contemporary historians of Shah Jahan as being planted with fruitful trees of diverse kinds interlaced with each other in such a way that the sky is not anywhere visible from under them. So they were not only pleasant spaces to use, but they also provided fruit and vegetables. And Shah Jahan himself is recorded to have gone early in the morning with his page boys to pluck fruits from his garden. So all these qualities make the court not just an epitome of urban architectural patronage, but also represent one of the finest examples of a sustainable way of planning, building, and living. 
So what are the attributes of the fort that make it so and what can we learn from it? First, that despite being the favorite residence and the prized patronage of one of the richest rulers in the world, the Red Fort was designed to be socially inclusive. So it, as we saw, it was like a miniature city with all the opportunities for growth and interaction that a city should offer. And everyone, even the poorest inhabitants of the city and the empire, had a stake in the fort. Visually and spatially, there was no bar between the direct access linking the city to the emperor. And originally, a bridge led straight from the Chani Chok to the emperor's throne of justice in the Divaniyam. Secondly, the fort's design was ecologically and environmentally considerate. There's no unnecessary wastage of resources. I maintain these lawns that guzzle water and pass for gardens today. The fort's gardens were orchards. So they worked as productive areas, as well as places of entertainment and repose, and they also moderated the microclimate. The water itself was recycled, whether it was from the imperial bathing chambers or in the fountains, it was used further for irrigation, or for cooling, or for watering the animals in the court. And as we saw, the palaces of the emperor and his family, as well as all the other spaces in the court, whether built or open, were all multifunctional. Thirdly, the fort's design was an example of further development of the traditional ind indigenous courtyard typology, where not only were the proportions of the built and open spaces of the highest order, but where utilization of space was maximized and a minimum number of built structures were constructed. And finally, the fort's design displayed qualities which made design truly great, where no element is superfluous. None of its structures and spaces can be termed simply utilitarian or purely decorative. You cannot separate the form, structure, and decoration in them, as, for instance, in this view of the Divaniyam, where the arches and the columns not only have a functional role in uh, transmitting the forces of the roof, but also divide the space in a beautiful way and are themselves works of art in their detailing. So these are just some of um, the original attributes of the Red Fort that I've spoken about. Beyond its immediate form that we need to recognize and conserve, and we need to understand that the Red Fort encompasses many values that we still hold important and progressive in contemporary society today. And therefore, when we conserve the Red Fort today, we need to do it not just as an empty shell, It should restore the same qualities of inclusiveness, of concern for people, for the environment, and for material and human resources that Shah Jahan and his builders had. So while the different layers of history, which have left their mark on the fort, make it a site of great historical interest, its principal value in terms of world and Indian heritage continues to stem from its cultural, architectural, and artistic values of its original design. And it is thus imperative to ensure that the potency of this design is physically conserved as well as communicated. Um, it should not just be confined to a few academics, but communicated to all, all its people, whether as as researchers, as clients, designers, all of us should be equally the custodians as well as the stakeholders of our heritage. And we should be learning from the fort's ingenious planning and detailing so that we may also be able to celebrate life in the way that the fort did, in its establishment, in the ceremonies that mark the Empress sojourn in it, in the way artists, painters, poets, and singers uh, were given patronage, and in the form that its gardens utilized uh, the resources without wasting anything and made life beautiful even in the sweltering climate of Delhi. So we need to reinstate all these aspects of the Red Fort 
And therefore, what we need is a new method of conservation that involves people by first presenting to them information that is necessary to appreciate and understand the red port, and secondly, by implementing the conservation in a manner that includes instead of disregarding the citizens of this country. And perhaps then we may, able, uh, we may be able to fulfill in some measure the wish of the makers of the red fort inscribed in good faith on the walls of the Kwabka, the House of Dreams, Shah Jahan's sleeping chambers. May the emperor of the world, Shah Jahan, by his good fortune, the second lord of felicity in the royal palace with great magnificence ever be like the sun in the sky as long as foundation is indispensable with the building may the palace of his good fortune touch the highest heaven thank you thank you for being uh, on this journey with me and accompanying me through space and time I hope that whenever you next visit Red Fort, you will be able to visualize what it was like and how it appeared and functioned and what it looked like, even though you may not be able to see many of its original spaces physically on the ground today. Therefore, that we can appreciate, all of us, the Red Fort beyond just the conventional uh, predominant view in which it is represented and limited today. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>